The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, we welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Here is your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Your Legislators. That this program is about you people connecting with these people who are seated here with me tonight and uh, giving you the opportunity to ask questions and get some sense of directions we're taking here in St. Paul during this legislative session. I'm Jim Thorin, and uh, very honorably sitting in for Barry tonight. He'll return again next week for the next episode, if you will, of Your Legislators. Well, uh, you know the format. If you've been a fan of the program and been with us before, you call with your questions. The phone number is right on the screen, or you may email us. Yeah, with your questions. And please do that. The more questions we have, the more chance we have to uh, pass that along to our legislators here who not only can answer the questions, but can bring the thoughts back to their respective workplaces right up the street in the Minnesota State Capitol and in the office building and the new Senate building. Anyway, it's, uh, let's get going here. We're, we, we've got uh, three legislators tonight. We don't have a, a quartet. We've got a trio. Uh, but we have some people who are very well established in doing what they do in their respective bodies. One senator, two representatives tonight. And we're going to introduce them for you. And we'll start to my left with Representative Phyllis Kahn from Minneapolis. Uh, Representative, would you describe your district a bit? And uh, how long have you been to the legislature? Well, quite a while, actually. I was first elected in 1970. My district is um, kind of a 3S district. It's got seniors, Somalis, and students. And um, it's, it has it, uh, all of, just about all of southeast Minneapolis and then goes down to into south and Cedar Riverside and Seward. About as urban a district as we have in Minnesota, right? It's pretty yeah. urban. Yeah. Pretty diverse. Right. <laughs> and yeah. it's changed. It's changed every right. year. Uh, every redistricting has changed. I've moved further south. Without moving. Right. All right. <laughs> well, I've well, thank you, Representative. Um, and next we have uh, Senator Tom Saxog from Grand Rapids. Not urban in your district. No, certainly not. Uh, I'm a four-term state senator representing the people of uh, Senate District 5. Uh, that... Uh, uh, to give you some description of that district, uh, uh, it's bordered on the west with the city of Bemidji, east on the city of Grand Rapids, south, let's say, Walker, and right in the middle is the Chippewa National Forest and the Leech Lake Indian Reservation. Um, and the economy is based, it's a natural resource-based economy uh, with uh, basically forest, uh, the forest industry, the mining industry, and the tourism industry being the three major. Three big ones for the, the three state of Minnesota. Ones. Yeah, yeah. They sure they are. Good to have you here, Senator. Thank you. And we have also Chris Swedzinski, representative, a Republican from Ghent, Ghent, Minnesota, southwest part of our state. Yes, a good Belgian town down wow. in uh, southwest Minnesota. Oh. And uh, yeah, my, 16A is my district, uh, Lacaparral County, Yellow Madison, a good chunk of line and a sliver of Redwood County, uh, kind of the Minnesota River as it heads out from the little point in uh, the western part of Minnesota and uh, kind of going south from there. Uh, a lot of agriculture is a big part. Also manufacturing, food manufacturing is a big part of our uh, industries down down there. So thanks for having us on. Well, it's always a delight to have you here. We know that our, our viewers from week to week enjoy the opportunity to have questions presented directly to you. So what I'm going to do for this program tonight, and I'm not quite sure how Barry would handle it, but I'm going to go back the other way with question number one, starting with Representative Swazinski, okay. and we'll toss it to you first, and then 
uh, Rep, uh, Senator Saxog and Representative Khan will have their opportunity. So, a uh, caller from Minneapolis uh, sends to us this question. Um, well, actually, they're making a statement. That their statement is that if reductions were made in the welfare system, there would be more workers available. So that's an assertion, and how does that work out? Well, um, you know, it's, I think it's the government's job. We really want to encourage folks uh, to enter the working uh, the area of work. Um, I think, uh, you know, when you look at some of the businesses, whether it be in southwest Minnesota or even the metro, I know there's a lot of folks that are uh, uh, asking folks to come and take a look. It doesn't take a whole lot of uh, time to, as you're driving down the highway. Uh, to see, you know, help wanted signs. But it's, you know, I think the biggest question is how are you moving folks up that economic ladder? And uh, whether it be mining jobs up in uh, northeast Minnesota or agribusiness jobs down in southwest Minnesota or, or some other type of uh, uh, economy job uh, within the city of Minneapolis. I think that's really the goal, uh, you know, to encourage investment within the state of Minnesota so that we have that high-tech industry that's going to bring us to the next generation and move people up that economic ladder. And, and whether that be a welfare program, you know, I think we're all in agreement that I think there should be some sort of a, you know, you hit on some hard times, something should be there, but uh, also I think a lot of folks would say that uh, there's also maybe a period of time that it's time to time to get things going and, and uh, let's see how this thing works. So, All right. And uh, Senator Saxon? You well, two years ago I was assertion. part of, uh, of a, um, an economic task force. I was the chairman, actually. There was eight senators, four Republicans, um, uh, four Democrats, all all rural, um, and uh, we got together and, and tried to decide what what uh, rural Minnesota needed to, uh, in fact, make the economy go. And what was it, what was the matter with our economy? And we came to the conclusion that yes, there was unemployed people in in uh, in rural Minnesota. But for the most part, our problem there is that we didn't have the trained, educated workforce that we needed to fill the jobs that uh, that uh, were available. And so um, that has been the thrust, uh, actually, of the eight of us. And we've uh, we've uh, authored some uh, bills, uh, particularly with um, a career counseling in our high schools, trying to get trying to get to high school kids before they're seniors in high school and saying, hey. You know, you might want to think about some of the, um, whether we're talking agriculture, manufacturing, forestry, forestry products, mining, uh, you might want to think about some of these things. And by the way, we're prepared to uh, help you with your career and, and uh, give you the education and the training that you need to stay in rural Minnesota and fill those jobs. I think that it's a long process. You don't do this all of a sudden. but. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I think, as, as uh, Chris intimated, that uh, um, it's it's important that um, w you know we're w we we think that most people, not all people, but most people who are part of the welfare system are on are trying to make their way up, and we and we got to help them do that. So it's important. And Representative Gunn. I can add much to, uh, to what my two colleagues said. I think uh, training is really important. Educational opportunities are really important. And, of course, one of the big issues is STEM jobs, the science, yeah. technology, engineering, exactly. and mathematics. Huh. And we really have to make sure that we have good preparation for um, the kids in school to be able to go on to higher education in those fields. You know, Phyllis, that's a great, uh, great point. I think you know, especially in rural, when you talk yeah. rural colleges, yeah. Tom, to uh, you know, just making sure that our schools of higher learning are regionally significant. You know, so that does that school, whether it be a, a Southwest or whatever school that might be, do they fit the local economy? Are they offering the majors that are going to, uh, you know, so that when those businesses are out there recruiting? Are they going to be drawing from, you know, Boston or, or some other place? You know, Midwest life is not the same as, as some other parts of the world. And how, you know, you're best off trying to recruit someone that grew up in the area, and the best thing to do is if they're going to get their education, they're going to get it close to home. Exactly. If I might follow up on that, because, uh, you know, in, in my day, uh, mom and dad and said, you're going to college. You're going to get your college mm -hmm. degree. And I did. took a little while, but I got there. Uh, now, now there are some some thoughts that, you know, if we really put some people into good two-year training, mm. 
uh, and then get them into a journeyman or get them into some other, that there is an opportunity there that is different from the college experience. I, I got to tell you my story. My story about when I was in ninth grade and our ninth grade civics teacher, he gets up in front and he says, now, kids, if you were in Europe, you would be taking a test and it would decide whether you were yes. going to go to trade school or you were going to go to college. And, and everybody went, ooh. <laughs> you know, as I think back, you know, that's probably, that, that model probably would have served us a lot better mm. in real Minnesota for sure. Well, I, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, you, you travel in, in western and southern Minnesota, held wanted signs all over. Mm. I mean, these great uh, manufacturing yep. firms are looking for mm. people. And maybe, Phyllis, it's the same in the, in the metro. Yes, I'm I think. not a yeah, problem. You got, yes. Problem. You don't have any. This is, this is, you have a shortage yeah. of workers there. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, right. we, well, the problem is we don't have, we have a shortage of workers and we have a shortage of people ready to fill those yeah. jobs. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's why the uh, technical training mm. and STEM yeah. training is so important yeah. and it's so important to have people uh, looking looking to mm -hmm. do it and I always as the only woman here on this table I will always put in this you know thing that the problem that we've had with discouraging girls from going into those mm -hmm. fields yeah. and one of the things is I visited an engineer about the importance of a two-year education I visited an engineering class at the University of Minnesota recently and the first surprise I had was it didn't look that much better than when I mm -hmm. went to school. I think there were two young women in it. I think women have done well now in things like law and medicine, but they're still not getting into engineering, really. But um, then the other question, but the question that was asked was how many had come to this class from a two-year institution, and it was like half the class sure. had. And that, I thought, was just absolutely terrific because mm -hmm. you're getting people are getting a less expensive education oh, yeah. and they're also getting something that probably s puts them in good stead for summer jobs mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. All right, we're going to move on to another topic. A reminder for our uh, viewers that uh, this is Your Legislators. And the more questions we receive this evening, the better off we are here and the more you will learn. So um, pick up the telephone, get online, and send us your questions, and we'll bring them to you as we go through the course of the evening. Uh, I'm going to move over to uh, Senator Saxog. We're going to start with a, uh, a rural question. This one uh, is from a farmer. Now, yours is not the same farming community as is Representative Swinzinski's. They're still farming, but different types of farming. So this farmer asks, if the legislature will provide any compensation to farmers for buffer strips. We've heard that one before. And I'm not sure you have the buffer strips problem there. Well, I think, that, does I think that's a great question for me, uh, even though, as you say, my, uh, uh, my district is not particularly farm related. It's more forestry related and mining related and tourism related. But, but we, we just passed off the Senate floor today, uh, our buffer, uh, our buffer bill. And uh, in fact, uh, it, uh, it, it got bipartisan support. And what we did is, is we, uh, uh, we kind of backed off a little bit what we had passed last year. And uh, not, so, not, from the, not from the rivers, not from the streams, but from the buffers the buffer zones around the um, um, what ditches. Am I yeah, around the ditches. Yeah. And not saying that we aren't going to do that, but but uh, making it uh, reasonable for the farmers to do. And and I think as most of us have said, you know, if you want, if we're, we are going to require that you do this. Uh, right now, what we passed had the local, the counties. If the counties want to take it over, they'll be they can do it, and that's good because you got local control. And we probably need to pay the farmers something for the buffers. Those two things, local control and buffers. There, there is a there is a caveat in there. If it doesn't get done, then then you know then it goes on to Bowser or whoever. But. Uh, 
I think I think the solution that we came up with, and it was and it was uh, the the uh, the author of the bill was Senator Scoy, who was a farmer himself, so he he understands what the situation is. I and but as a, a big part of this was Senator Marty, um, who's you know who's who's known to be a an, av an avid and. Uh, and, and strict environmentalists. So between the two of them, they came up with a compromise, which I, we'll see what the House thinks okay. of, but I think it's got a lot of good points in it. Well, okay. you're, you're assuring me that Senator Marty voted for it? He did. It was, he, he, was, he, was, he was on the other side. <laughs> it, was his, it, was, he, it was he and Scoy's bill. Okay. Well, then let's we'll, uh, we'll come back to Chris in, in western Minnesota, but first to Representative Kahn. Well, that makes he, me feel pretty comfortable. I don't, you know, I didn't see what went on in the Senate, but that makes me feel pretty comfortable about yeah. the ability to support it. And it looks as if that's kind of like the old days when we used to get along. Oh, there isn't a, you didn't mention any Republican, though. But <laughs> when well, we used to get along and sort of work out problems instead of fight at each other's throats. Yeah, uh, I just interject, yeah. but there, as I said, it was a bipartisan okay, vote. Great. So, yeah. Good. All right. Uh, and now, for Chris, you've got buffer strips. We, we have buffer strips. Uh, you know, I, well, think the need there, we, right? I think we had a calendar. We were planning on do, taking up that same bill today. Uh, Representative Torkelson is the, the chief yeah. author, who's also a farmer, Republican. Uh, His name was mentioned on the floor, on the Senate floor, a number of times as being part of this whole oh. compromise. Well, I, okay. I think, I think you've got to put a dollar in a jar every time you do that. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know, Representative Torkelson has been working uh, really a lot of hours yeah. on this bill. Yeah. and, and uh, uh, working with a lot of the stakeholders, I know Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, yep. uh, a lot of the, the large egg exactly. organizations. I think there is still a lot of apprehension. Uh, when I talk to my constituents, they're uh, very concerned about what it's going to mean to, you know, land is they, they quit making it. And for the same reasons folks want to protect it, farmers want to be able to make sure they protect their, their investments as well. Because it's not a, a single lifetime, it's a generational investment mm -hmm. that most farmers, family farms have made over generation after generation. You know, maintaining and keeping that investment within the family and passing it on to the next generation. And I think, uh, you know, absolutely, I think there needs to be uh, some port where the state, as a state mandate, as this is coming down uh, from St. Paul, needs to play, pay a financial role in that. Uh, you know, I know, like, redetermination, we're going to get in the weeds a little bit with that. There is some financial compensation through that process, but really, uh, you know, not leaving this on the hook of just locals, but really, uh, you know, if this, is, this has been Governor Dayton's uh, initiative, uh, it kind of was born out of my district. They had a a meeting down uh, in my neck of the yeah. woods that this was born out of. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I tell you what, it's definitely raised some hair uh, on a, a number of my neighbors. Uh, but also, uh, you know, it's, it's been state law since 1970 something uh, that this was to move forward. Yeah. And uh, I think under current law, it was going to take over 40 years uh, to implement. And uh, this definitely put a, a speed on the track. And there's some counties, I think Ottertail County, uh, a little bit further north, uh, has been, a, you know, they did it a number of years ago. They've had 100% okay. okay. buffer strips. And, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's going to take a little bit of work, and I think the state's going to have to step up. But, uh, is, you know, we're is, working uh, our way through that. So. Is, is there a, a portion or maybe a, minor, a majority of the farm groups or the individual farmers who would argue simply, well, look, if you're taking 25 feet, 50 feet for my production, you pay me for it. Sure. If you do that, we'll put in a strip. Does it ever get that simple? Well, you know, I think the the biggest worry, though, when it comes to state dollars is also I, there, what's the state going to do and what's the state going to require? Because, you know, if you keep the, you know, most of the decisions are going to be made locally. A lot of those things are going to come from, you know, local decisions and how the process works. Sure. Is the berm up? Should, you know, if water can't run through the side of a hill, should there be a buffer on it? Because a lot of times you have those ditches as they've been dug out over the last 50 years. I mean, there's a hill there and there's no water going to run through. Yeah. And what makes sense? And I think that's what, I think some of this bill, Representative Torkelson's, uh, Rep. Senator Scoey's bill, works to address. And I think, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, Hopefully, I think it's definitely moving in the right direction because I think the expansion into private ditches okay. was a big problem because I think a lot of folks knew that that was never part of the conversation mm -hmm. and it was a big overreach when it came to the governor is, and staff. Is there the common concern for the water quality? Does anybody really dispute that? No. That no. there are problems in our water quality, particularly in, uh, in your area? Uh, sure. Chris, it's, uh, well, you, you know, I think... Every every farmer believes, you know, whether it be nitrate levels or whatever, they're they're not putting on any more on the ground than they should because it's expensive. I mean, especially now with inputs, 
uh, you know, with three dollar and twenty cent corn and beans, uh, you know, hover around that eight to nine dollar mark. I mean, fertilizers are a big part of your inputs, and uh, you know, it's not our job to to you know, just throw that stuff out there because that, those are real dollars. We want to make a smart investment. Well, to the same extent, what does the science say? You know, does a, does a buffer actually do what they say it's going to do? And, uh, you know, I think that's left up for some debate. And uh, it well, might I, feel I, people I'm willing to work backwards. In other words, there's very little question in my mind the Minnesota River Valley is the most polluted area in the state of Minnesota. So as you work back from the Minnesota River Valley, how, how do you make, how do you clean that up? Yeah. And, and that's... That's all we got to do, I think. But I, but again, I think we're, I think we're making some. Uh, I think we're going to see some progress this year. I, I, as I look down the pike at, at this very short session, uh, and I'm hoping just because, as you say, what uh, Representative Torkelson was a part of with this thing, if we can put this together, this may be one of the great victories of the. It's you know, a landmark legislation. Yep. Uh, yeah, right. for sure. this session. Sure. All right. Um, screw up the microphone. Well, uh, I, well, we'll find out from I, the engineers. Governor, <laughs> or from the sure. viewers at home. Governor, I get to joke. say something about yeah, this? Of course, sure. No. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm a tax and spend liberal, so I'm perfectly <laughs> happy to pay for something good to happen. And then the other thing is the one agricultural issue I've been intimately involved with as things have gone on is the question of industrial hemp as a crop. Mm -hmm. And that's a crop. I, I tried to think it would be a good buffer crop, but it isn't. It needs a wider <laughs> expanse than that. So it's got to go into the field next to the buffer yeah. strip. But the profitability is there, and the environmental um, positives of growing that crop are really there. Perhaps so two we'll birds of one stone if we could. Yes. Huh? Uh, your legislators is the name of the program if you're just joining us. Uh, we invite your questions, and you can do that by telephone, or you may send us a note by uh, your computer sitting right next to you, and we'll bring the question to our legislators tonight. We do have with us Representative Phyllis Kahn, a Democrat from Minneapolis, uh, Senator Tom Saxog, Senator from Grand Rapids, and Representative Chris Wibzinski, who is a Republican from Ghent, Minnesota. So, as a matter of fact, I'm going to turn next to uh, Senator Tax, uh, Saxog because we were having a discussion before going on the air. And the question uh, comes to us from Mata Video. Uh, as the state continues to their efforts to attract and keep veterans living in Minnesota, what's your position on the bills in the House and Senate to build new veterans' homes in Mata Video and Bemidji? Well, um, uh, did we hit a home run here? <laughs> we, we, we've been working uh, diligently on this, and uh, and again, uh, this is this is Chris ter Chris's territory in uh, in Montevideo, my territory in Bemidji, which uh, are the two areas where the the two new uh, nursing homes uh, I think uh, uh, are widely recommended to go. Uh, and the new, the one that the one veterans nursing home that we're just wrapping up isn't exactly in in uh, Representative uh, Khan's uh, district, but it's not too far away. It's in Minneapolis. Yeah, it is. It is. So um, we're all. I think we're all concerned uh, with uh, with the veterans taking good care of the veterans, uh, particularly as we get into the uh, Vietnam era, era uh, uh, vets and. Uh, and where they're going to go, uh, you know, when they when they need to have uh, you know, extended care, mm -hmm. and so um, I think it's important that we recognize that uh, um, to get the funding and the say so for veterans' homes in the, in Minnesota or any other state, you have to um, um, bond or use some other way of raising money as to raise a portion that you can leverage federal funding for the their homes and and right now we think that uh, that the federal government will allow us 143 homes we think that 70 in Montevideo and 70 in Bemidji <laughs> northwestern Minnesota and southwestern Minnesota are the two parts of the state that aren't covered that's mm -hmm. why we're picking them mm -hmm. now is that vetted through the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs first or does that come solely from the legislature no, that does come from the from the Minnesota uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. 
But you know, it, it's this has been going on for a long time. These two these two communities have worked hard uh, to be in line for these. Uh, they raised a lot of money. You bet. Uh, and uh, and 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 not only that, but they've they've shown a lot of interest, and they have a lot of veterans, mm -hmm. and uh, those are those are great combinations. So, well, so, but but there's two major things we have to do in raising money. One bonding, which we were doing, and the second is you have to raise a certain amount of operating expenses and prove you can do that over three years. And we think we have the bills to do that. So, so the bonding is separate from the major bonding bill. Or part of no, it's it. part, part of it. it. Okay, part yeah. of it. And so, Chris, in Montevideo, if things go as they're appearing to go, mm. you'll have in a matter of a couple of years, maybe construction, new homes for veterans. Well, you know, I think that's a a, a, a big hope. And uh, you know, I think when you visit with with vets groups, I had a, a bunch of guys in here the other week, and uh, you know, that's always on their mind. Yeah. And you know, when I ask them, uh, you know, what would you have? Would you rather, you know, if you had your your wish of wishes, I think if you're a veteran, whether you stayed at a, a veteran's home that was specifically built, or you could stay in your hometown, you know, it's a mixed bag. Some guys would want to travel and stay there. Mm -hmm. Some folks would like to stay in there. I wish the federal government would maybe get off their can and maybe look at. <laughs> ways that, that guys would uh, could stay and make that choice. Right. Yep. Um, and, I mean, obviously you can choose wherever you want, yep. but just the finances of it all is getting, a little different. Than, getting uh, off your can, one of those technical terms. But, right. No, no, but, so, I would like no, that. You have what I would like. home in Minneapolis, Yeah, right? but not, not in my district. Right, but, yeah. but within folks. Minneapolis. But the, yeah. uh, um, I think we ought to seriously look at the kinds of programs that help people stay in their homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Them, and help them do that. But also, I know um, uh, my father was a veteran. He was a doctor in the Army in World War II, oh, and then he was a doctor in the Veterans Hospital. Mm -hmm. And he was just, um, no, he, uh, I, I actually don't think, he never did go to a veteran's. He never did go to a veteran's home, but he was almost looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's, that, his memory of being with, sure. being as part of the Army mm -hmm. and then also being as the doctor in the veteran's hospital was... A lot of stories. Was, uh, of stories. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in one of, these, one of these coming years, I'm now living in Brainerd, but I've lived in Bemidji. So if the veteran's home is in Bemidji, I guess I know what direction it might go, although Montevideo is a wonderful town. There's people <laughs> down there that I've known that... So I've got good quality. Maybe, maybe Good quality. Maybe I'll have a great big yeah. decision to make. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Representative uh, Khan, we're going to move on to you with our next question because it, it, it comes around every session. Uh, it comes to us from Maple Grove. The, it's a legislation or a, or a question about transportation. Our, all legislators generally agree we need to fix roads. So where are the dollars going to come from? And uh, the caller's solution, from one perspective, is to put a voluntary tax on TV and radio political ads. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't do any of them, so, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure it affects affects me. I'm a strong supporter of a gas tax. I think, particularly as gas tax, as well, we've seen the fluctuation in gas prices, and as they went down so dramatically, people wouldn't have even seen a 10 cent gas tax or anything like that. So I really wish that we had been able to do that. That's a good, nice, solid source. It's, it's a tried and true practice, but as I'm reading reports of legislative action or listening right. to them Doesn't, on the radio, mm -hmm. it's not getting a lot of traction this year, or so it appears. Uh, Chris, right. your take? You know, I would agree. I think, you know, Governor, I, you know, that's a very interesting idea to tax political ads, but uh, <laughs> you know, we could just maybe ban them, too. That might help. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in all reality, I think, uh, you know, I think whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I think most folks agree that uh, there needs to be some major improvements to our transportation system. Uh, you know, Republicans put before mm -hmm. their, their policy where they're taking some cash and looking at auto parts and, and some of those sales taxes and trying to look at ways to dedicate those. Um, and uh, you know, I know there's a few other plans out there, but you know, it's going to take real dollars and uh, a real investment because uh, you know, whether it's roads and bridges or culverts in a township or small cities under 5,000 mm -hmm. or over 5,000, you know, those are all part of those equations. And the way you decide to fund it will drastically affect uh, 
know, what's going to get done? And, uh, you know, I think uh, that's one. You look at the Constitution, you know, that is actually one of the big parts of what the state of Minnesota and what uh, legislators were supposed to do. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, you're talking to more metro members. Uh, folks are talking about transit. Uh, and other things, but uh, you know, when I talk to my constituents, the most important things is is roads and bridges and, and dollars uh, for small towns. And you know, the house budget that we put through, we put a few million dollars in for cities below 5,000. Uh, that was kind of a neat part that you know, the regular gas tax doesn't really focus on those cities. It's cities above 5,000. So it was really kind of a neat part to, to visit with folks and see what they were able to do just with some of those dollars, and hopefully be able to invest in that again. No, oh, Senator Saxog, I know that. Met well in, in your part of the state as well, uh, rural uh, transit is important for getting seniors particularly to different appointments and from a grocery store to mm -hmm. pharmacy. Uh, in terms of your district, transportation funding most needed in, well, how many ways can we count? Well, it, 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 yes, there's no question about it that, uh, that mass transit uh, is, is really very important. Uh, but that kind of comes as a percentage of, of how you raise your money here. And, and, I, and I think we have to have dedicated funding, and whether that dedicated funding is, is a gas tax, a sales tax on auto parts, or, or uh, car rentals, or registrations, you know, I, I guess it really doesn't matter. I, I think it should be some combination, but it, it, it needs to get done. Um, I think that if we don't come up with a some kind of a dedicated tax, uh, that we're going to end up uh, this year in the state legislature of deciding be whether we want a, uh, uh, a tax bill or a, or a uh, transportation bill, and because we're going to have X amount of dollars that we have in surplus that we could use for this for, you know, one time or a two-year uh, uh, operation, and. And uh, we're either going to do uh, tax cuts or we're going to spend some money on transportation. And I, th I don't think you can do both. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. That's, that's where this last five weeks is going to be a very interesting uh, uh, go around. Well, you're veterans of the crunch time. When you get down to those last, how many hours? 48, 24? Yeah. Uh, how quickly it flies when you're in the midst of that, and you don't get rest, <laughs> I, I think I can say. Yeah. And so as you get into that whole thinking and, and, and the posturing from one party to the other, House to the Senate, whatever it might be, uh, it comes down to those key few minutes, sometimes in conference committee. So is there a way to, to break that log jam and do it differently? Well, I think most papers when you go to college get written in the last couple of days. <laughs> you know, it's, good point. You know, it's. Uh, I think uh, that habit's hard to break. And uh, from a legislative standpoint, I mean, you work well with with deadlines. And uh, you know, the, the I think the issues are, you know, are the conversations happening behind the scenes? And right. I think a lot of times, you know, chairs are talking to each other from the House side to the Senate. And uh, you know, I mean, just the, the budget target, just kind of the constraints are in. You know, the tax bill that the House uh, Republican. Uh, Passed was a, almost a $2.2 billion tax relief bill last year. Yeah. Um, and I think the Senate's uh, was a, a fair bit smaller than that. Uh, I said on the tax conference committee. Oh, and wow. so, just uh, from that standpoint, uh, we live in a different world right now. We've got $900 million in surplus. Uh, we know that we're going to want to put some into transportation, some into taxes. So, by nature, I think the, the Senate has said maybe $300 million in tax relief. Uh, we know that we're working within that confine. So where we were a year ago, you know, we're 2.2 to maybe 500 million or 300 million. I forget where the Senate bill was at. Now we're at least between 300 and 900. And so, uh, you know, I think your, your point is well taken. And I think uh, we can't do everything. And uh, we, we're going to have to look hard at, at making uh, commitments, but also priorities from transportation. Patient well, what, uh, the, the worst thing that I thought was the deep secrecy of the last session. I'd never seen so much stuff done totally in private. I mean, everyone knows when I first came into office is when we first started the concept of an open conference committee. And everyone knew that maybe the last few minutes were decided, were decided in private and that you had to end up doing that. But this shutting things off for the amount of time that they were in the last session I thought was appalling. I'm also not a fan of all these rigid rules about how 
how early amendments have to be submitted and that kind of thing. I think it takes the creativity to say that you can't do something because there's a change on the House and you can't be thinking mm. on the House floor is a real mistake in the legislative process. And I don't like the yeah. I don't like the cutting yeah. out cutting the cutting out late night sessions. I always get my would get my second wind at about three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well you know, and I'm, I'm not sure what you're energy. describing, Representative Khan, is is any more open than we saw last time around. I I did think that the leadership in the House and the Senate, uh, Todd, particularly Dick, uh, uh, Majority Leader Bach and, and Speaker Doubt, uh, came up with some pretty good uh, objectives. Uh, I think that um, we had uh, one of the better uh, education bills that we've had in decades. Uh, I thought our health and human services bill was, was pretty good. I thought everything was pretty good except transportation and taxes. And, taxes. <laughs> and they were non existent. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have them. We just we ended without it. Right. And uh, what's, what's made it a little bit this way is that we have surpluses. And, and if you really look at it this year, I don't anticipate it's going to be this way, but we can go home without a tax bill or a transportation bill. We can do it. it is, we're, we, we don't have to uh, pass any more bills, and we can go on the way we are. Education funding, health and human services funding will go on. State government will go on. Um, I don't think that would be wise, but... We're not, we're not watching well, things by the hour yet, No, but uh, the time grows short. No. Well, Chris, you can take this lesson back to your caucus, because they're the ones who okay. are, they're the ones who are now, sort right? of talking non-bonding, non-bonding, or small bonding, is that whenever the party in charge has not passed a bonding bill, they've ended up not in charge after the next election. So just sure. remind no. them of that. Well, I think, you know, it, it takes a bipartisan <laughs> approach to pass a bonding bill. Right. 81 votes. But and the party in charge gets blamed if well, they can't do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, but the other would thing... That be, would yeah. that be the Senate? But, or would but that the, no, no, the Senate's <laughs> going to pass one. The Senate's you know, going to put a great I, so bonding witness, bill together and pass you know, it. I, when I witnessed the last deal was, uh, you know, there was the House, it was the governor, and in the middle was the Senate. <laughs> and, and that's well, kind of how it ended up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe uh, watch, watch the Senate. You know, that could be where Looking it's for a repeat. Be. Well, you know, I think the legislature is about relationships. Yeah, it is. And I think, uh, you know, Speaker Doubt and uh, Majority Leader Bach, and I think they have a pretty good rela working relationship. I think they do. And I think, you know, I think ah, there, okay. there's good relationships on, in, in, from the governor's office with Speaker Doubt as well. Yep. Um, I'm com pretty confident in his abilities uh, to get the deal done. And, uh, you know, I think we got a lot of work to do and some, some, some compromise here along the way, but uh, well, all right, job. It so. would be a little nicer if he paid a little bit more. <laughs> attention to the rules of the house but in some all of his right decisions. now uh, <laughs> viewers we're going to move on to another topic <laughs> and, it, and it is connected yeah because it's all connected yeah right? when right the legislature is in session sure uh, this uh, this comes into us a question about uh, with the surplus of regular monies is there what they call regular monies is there any consideration for increasing the city funding uh, he this person's on a city council and they're getting far less money than they did back in 2009, sure. and they're looking for LGA. Sure. So, I, Chris? Sure. Um, you know, that's a that's a tax provision, uh, so that would be the commonly known as LGA for counties. It would be, you know, county program aid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think there's uh, definitely some possibilities for that. I think oh. uh, in our bill, uh, we had some dollars put away for that. Um, it may not have been as much as some, and we might have had some cities excluded in that. Uh, cities of the first class <laughs> uh, part of that, right. but uh, we, we, we <laughs> remember that. Uh, nothing <laughs> personal, but uh, uh, you know, I think that's that's part of the. I think uh, we all agree that uh, our cities need to be able yes. to provide some basic services. Yes. You know, and making sure that if you get in a car accident, there's a fire truck there to come pull you out. You know, those types of things. And I think, especially for small, especially small rural towns and and uh, you know, cities across the state. You know, I think it's made a big difference. And and I'm, I, you know, that's what I'm. Those goals that I'm working okay. towards personally. And, well, of course, my city is the one that puts all the money in to fund all that. So you know, we would. And we also have, you know, some of the very serious problems mm -hmm. in the state. So, again, every time something like this comes up, I point out again that I'm a tax and spend Democrat, and I'm perfectly happy to put on the taxes that we need to pay for the programs that we need. And they don't have to be in my district. 
For no, all I'll, practical I, purposes, I, though, the tax conference is still in session, mm -hmm. yes. and yeah. this guy's on it. So right. he's oh, important. Wow. He's important <laughs> man. So. <laughs> well, you're bringing back the thoughts here, and uh, time will tell, as as they say. And I I know uh, Representative Khan when I come to Minneapolis and I visit because I do love coming here for a Twins game now and then. So I spend my money here, and we'll also appreciate it when you come up to Brainerd and you spend your money there. Uh, just or going up to Grand Rapids, yes. you're out to Montevideo. So, um, okay, we are going to move along here on your legislators. Um, question here uh, Are you going to pass a bill for wage increases for people who work with others with disabilities, both mm -hmm. physical and mental? Uh, this individual says we can't get enough staff hired mm -hmm. because they work mm -hmm. elsewhere for more money. So, where do we sit? Phyllis? Again. Uh, clearly, we should. I think we increased them. A, uh, we increased that a little bit last year, and I, we need to move. We need to move up on that. We also need to move the um, MFIP, the family uh, um, family program, up. Also, you know, we we it's it, in in the uh, in the long term sense, it just makes sense to be able to keep people in to not have to have them replaced all the time. So I totally support that. Senator? Well, it's, it, w the theme has been the 5%. Mm -hmm. and uh, Better Life Alliance, I think. A better Life Alliance. Alliance. I changed. don't think it's going to end up at 5%, but I think we'll try to get a couple percentages mm -hmm. in there. You see the same challenges out west? Well, absolutely. You know, I think uh, the last budget uh, that the, the Senate and the House put together and the governor, uh, we put over $138 million into nursing homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's made a big difference. Uh, sure. You had a lot in uh, probably across the state, really kind of a cost of delivery uh, was probably the biggest way it was kind of calculated. And so it really meant, you know, for some places, 600000 mm -hmm. to a million dollars more per location. And uh, a lot of those dollars went straight into, you know, recruiting of staff, whether you be an LPN, RN, uh, uh, certified nursing assistant, you know, all the rest. And I think part of that's the training, too, is trying to, you know, we talked, that was the first question of, of how do you kind of get people up off of welfare. Mm -hmm. And, right. you know, it's those training programs, you know, there's a strong uh, program in Marshall to, to really see, how, you know, try to get those folks kind of baseline. How do you get them working? How do you get them to treat people well? And uh, I think the question really is with working with the disabled. So that would be like the group homes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so just yeah. as much, those that's are where the five. Yeah, yeah so right. the 5% would be yeah. for the group homes. And, and so th they, they kind of work out of the same you know, pot of folks. So right. the same people that are passionate about serving people, whether it be in a nursing home, are the same people that are per passionate about serving people in a group home. And so when the wages change dramatically for nursing homes, it puts these, this group as a, at a disadvantage when it comes to recruitment. Does, so, does Ghent have a nursing home? We do not. We, okay. I've got a but, lot of them. But it's, a, but it's yeah. little towns yeah. like that Absolutely. that have nursing homes where it's it's one of the biggest industries, mm -hmm. right? The biggest, biggest industry. employer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you know, the, it's really important. Just to uh, you know, we uh, Senator Dames and I, who you yeah. serve with, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just went for a tour uh, through I think the Madison uh, uh, nursing home, and that was built many years ago, and had I think at its peak like 160 beds. Yeah. And today it's in the mid 80s or 90, you know, 70s or 80s, and so the cost and the, just the style of care has changed so so much when it comes to dealing with the silver tsunami. Okay. Yeah. So the average stay used to be six months or eight months or a year. Now it's really being cut down so that it's really during those those last few years and last few months, really, uh, that where maybe families can't take care of them, they can't keep them in the home, that they do finally kind of relent and, and allow really the... the and then there's to take the that problem, do you mention facilities, the aging facilities, mm -hmm. and how do you correct them to provide services in the 21st century? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I'm going to move on to Senator Sachs uh, here because we've got a question about the Iron Range. It comes to us from Monticello. Uh, how long, when they say they... I, Prefer, I, I presume that it's referring to the legislature. How long did uh, they extend unemployment, and for how long have they been collecting? And I guess this would zero in on the problems that uh, the economy experiences on the Iron Range. Well, first of all, what we're talking about the uh, the exemption or the exception that we made that we passed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, was similar to what we did when the turkey farms uh, went uh, avian uh, flu. had the avian flu, and uh, it's it's because of uh, the dumping of steel uh, in the United States that 
Uh, we weren't, be able to, uh, weren't able to replace uh, those jobs. Consequently, um, we added another 26 weeks to, the, uh -huh. to what was going on. So that, that, will be, uh, uh, that will probably be the end. Um, but for, fortunately, I'm hopeful that uh, the price of steel is going up. Uh, it's, uh, it's slightly over $50 now, and, uh, and that uh, with uh, what uh, the federal government is doing with the dumping of steel, uh, that the steel, the, the steel market and, uh, and the uh, taconite plants will begin to open up and that, uh, as with the turkeys, mm -hmm. you know, this will, this will, uh, this will forward the, the problem that pass, we have. Yeah. Yeah. Did they open up? That was there news of something like opening oh, yeah, up there, in May yeah, or something in, like in that? In May there will be a couple of the, okay. the uh, machines that will open up. So okay. yeah, a ray of yeah. sunshine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really does get to, down as, um, to the price of steel. Hmm. You know, okay. Once that gets up, it's, sure. it will be fine. All right. We do have a question here from uh, Appleton, and you might guess what it's about. Um, they'd like to hear the comments on the Appleton prison situation. Uh, as you know, there's been talk about purchasing it for the state of Minnesota, or at least op opening it uh, up under the ownership of uh, community corrections, mm -hmm. but operating it as a Minnesota prison. So, uh, I can take it. It's my neck. Chris, road, so. you're, that's okay. right. Sure, you're sure. right I'll down the road first. Uh, obviously, take that one, Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Representative Miller has been really standing strong for that uh, on the north side of the river, and I've been working hard on it on the south side of the river. Uh, and uh, I know that Senator Coonan over in the Senate has been yeah. working hard, Senator Dames as well. Um, you know, I think uh, when it comes to beds, you know, they're estimating that we're going to be over 1,300 beds short of where we need to be, and it's utilizing a lot of the county prisons across the state to house uh, state prisoners. Um, you know, rather than, you know, this all stemmed from the governor having an initial proposal of building on to some existing, building a new prison or building on other beds, other parts of the state. And, uh, you know, I can tell you what, that definitely got folks excited out in our neck of the woods, saying, you know, rather than build, why don't we utilize a facility that's already built, already ready to go, essentially. Um, obviously, there's some work that probably needs okay. to get done before you start putting folks in. But, you know, really, uh, you know, it's going to be a big deal. It's, you know, that, that particular facility pays over a million dollars in property taxes to the county. I think it's Swift County that it's in. Mm -hmm. um, but also just, you know, what it does for the local economy, the creation of jobs, uh, those opportunities that it leaves for, for folks. And, uh, you know, there's, there's maybe some work at the state level when it comes to, to some reforms. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, our role as legislators is to make the best economic decision, uh, whether no matter what that is. And uh, I think building a, a prison or building onto them in the metro area doesn't make sense when we've got a perfectly good facility out in Appleton. Okay. Okay. Well, well, I, John, there was, partially, there was some, uh, I partially yeah. agree with that on the sense that uh, I'm totally opposed to the operation of a private prison. Um, I would have much less objection to the state buying that, mm -hmm. taking it over, and having it been a state prison. Uh, my position would be to get rid of all those prisoners to, that we have you know so we, we've put many many more people in jail than need to be in jail we're keeping them very much longer than we should be keeping them and um, I would like to see m much better programs to get people back into society and to stop putting them in jail in the first place and I don't have, I'm kind of in between I don't have a problem at all uh, with leasing the prison, uh, the state leasing the prison, but I, I want uh, state employees. Mm -hmm. yes. So that's where I'm at. In uh, my past work, I spent some time with a gentleman who was well acquainted with county government, and he said one of the problems that we have in society is understanding and making the difference between those people that we fear and those people that we just say, clean up your act. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not easy. I mean, the court system no? is very, yeah. very strapped yeah. with all of those tools, and yet we see this growing population in the state of Minnesota. Well, Jim, I think we all want folks to do their time if they've done the crime. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think some of the arguments for maybe leasing it or whatever would be getting folks out of the county systems because they don't have some of those, prop, those programs out there because, we don't, I mean, if you go to jail, we don't want you to ever come back. You know, I forget what, I think that was on the Blues Brothers. Or yeah. whatever, like, you don't ever want to see you come back. But, and, uh, you know, and that's, you, you turn your life around, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. Sure. And, uh, you know, uh, 
Yeah. All right, on to another topic here on your legislators. If you just tuned in, we have with us uh, Representative Phyllis Kahn, who is the senior member of the whole business over no, there. No, no. One of two. One of two. I have to always, always right. correct that. Same year. All right, thank you. <laughs> Senator Tom Saxog from Grand Rapids and Representative Chris Wedzinski from Ghent. Uh, so we're going to move on to another topic for this evening, one you've all heard before. This comes to us from Pine River. Uh, what would the legislators do to improve Minsure? How many letters in that word? Okay. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, it's more than four letters. Okay. I have the, f we, we did the first step. The big mistake that was done with, a, a big mistake that was done with Minsure was, and i sorry I blame it on the Senate because I watched it very carefully in the House, was taking Minsure out of the control of Minute, which is the state technological system. And I think the technology, you know, the, even the Minute people aren't sure that they could have totally fixed it. But taking out the most extensive technology um, program that we were doing in the state, taking it away from the people who knew the most about technology was a total mistake. And we fixed that. We've put it back in, and we've had also better cooperation with it. But I think that was the real negative on it. And so it's a little bit slow in so recovering. Are we it's experiencing a very, uh, better response yes, time? Yes, I think so. Okay. I think we're having a better response time, and I think we're having uh, um, much, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of things that were terrific. Nobody wants to go back to not having kids on their parents' plan uh, um, until the end. No one wants to go back to having people eliminated because of a prior condition and so forth. So, so Senator, in, in your hometown, your district, still a hot button, or is it settled down? Well, <clears throat> when, first of all, you got to look at the, uh, the, uh, the whole idea that uh, that the state of Minnesota has some of the finest access to health care in the whole United States. Okay, that that's that's given. Um, this this one particular situation with this one particular group of people uh, that we covered under Minshare, uh, nobody's bragging about the way we yeah. did it. I and I'm not, but it's slowly but surely becoming better. And uh, um, and uh, I, you know I. You know, I believe that it eventually we'll take care of our situation. So I, uh, I'm not proud of it, but it's getting better. So well, if we could only move a little faster to a single payer system, we'd be in much better well, shape. And I think one of the ways we ought to move to it is we ought to make a single payer system one of the options under Minsure. Yeah. Then we could kind of get an idea to see how that might work. Well, Chris, any feedback? Well, from there, you know, the yeah. Office of Legislative Auditor. Uh, had a lot of findings, uh, you know, whether it be folks that aren't necessarily qualified to be on the plans of the hundreds of millions of dollars that it's potentially costing uh, the state state of Minnesota. And I, I've talked to, other, you know, there's other, other reports that have come out that say it's maybe not even fixable. And, uh, you know, from a standpoint of, of, of its role and, uh, you know, that's, those are definitely things we're looking at. And uh, you know, I know Representative Matt Dean, uh, you know, if you're out there watching Pioneer Land or anywhere across the state, he's got a website. I don't even know what it's called. But if you've got some <laughs> stories you want to tell about your experience, uh, to report that. And, uh, yeah. So. Okay. so the real, but the real problem here, let's face it, is yeah. the price of health care. Yes. I mean, this is a, uh, insurance is nothing more than a reflection oh. of, of that. So unless you reduce or, or, or incentivize or uh, uh, become more efficient in your health, the way you do health care, you're not going to not gonna do any better. No other state's doing any better either. Well, the worst thing is the non-negotiable of, uh, uh, of pharmaceutical prices. But it's that has worked perfectly with the Veterans Administration and why we didn't do it with every other subsidized medical plan is just, there's four, I mean, we know why we didn't do There's four or five. It. I mean, you can throw drug companies, uh, mm. uh, insurance companies, uh, trial lawyers. I mean, you can <laughs> you can throw everybody in the pot. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not coming to, 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 to back up drug companies, but I just watched a, a video, I, th I forget what, oh. which channel it was on, and just a real cost there is uh, when it comes to developing, uh, you know, that next wonder drug. And especially if you're an orphan type drug or have an orphan disease where there's very few folks, I mean, those are 
real dollars they're putting away. But we don't have to pay for the European drug company. Well, but, 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 but what they do is they, how they negotiate is they say, we'll give you X amount of dollars for that pill, because all we have to do is take that pill and put it in a machine and figure out what's in it. They're not paying. I mean, someone's going to have to pay for development costs, and it happens to follow, uh, follow on uh, the shoulders of Americans today. I, and, think uh, I think I've just come upon the problem. They speak French and German, and we don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by well, the way, cattle, we have to be down to the know, last you know, you, me, you know, Medicare uh, does its drug yeah. on a... On a um, uh, uh, comp competitive yeah. basis. Yeah, and Medicaid should. So why doesn't everybody? Yeah, yes. they should. Well, we're going into the big Ooh, philosophical. Okay. That's more of a federal issue okay. anyway. But. Here, we've yeah. got. We, I can give you about a twenty-second right. answer on this question here, and it really Is that requires possible? more. We'll find all right. out. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Why don't you do something about cell phone reception in rural areas? He, this mm -hmm. caller from Porter says the governor is concerned about broadband, but this problem should be fixed first. That is to say, cell phone. Sure. Huh? Okay. Well, Porter, Porter yeah. is my neck of the woods, yep. and uh, you know I think uh, there is really a you know a big issue when it comes to market and access to market and, and encouraging investment. And whether it be broadband or whether that be a cell phone service, you know, I think the state can pay, play a role in encouraging that. And uh, we're setting aside some dollars for hotspots in our bill, on putting hotspots on school buses, allowing uh, students to check out hotspots oh, out of a library, okay. and uh, bring them home with them if they don't have access. And you know, from a cell phone standpoint, you know, we need, maybe need to be looking at that as well. A little uh, equal time. Right. Do you have a problem in Minneapolis, Representative Khan? No, I don't no. think so. Okay. <laughs> all right. Or the Senator Senator uh, Sachs. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's towers all around, but there's yeah. always spots like that. Uh, you know that's that's a competitive hey, that's a competitive of the state deal. Building. That's and a competitive deal too. But terrible. I could, but I couldn't agree with the um, and and I heard Senator Box say the same thing today. We ought to get, take care of those uh, take care of the cell phones before we take care of the yes. okay. broadband. All right. With that, uh, lady and gentlemen, I want to say thank you, Representative Chris Swidzinski from Ghent, mm -hmm. uh, Senator Tom Saxog from uh, the Iron Range. And Grand Rapids. Well, great yeah. range. Yeah. And well, Representative Strange Con. <laughs> West one, of our, one of our senior legislators from Minneapolis. Thank you so much for being part yeah. of the thank your you legislators. So much. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so stay tuned next week, same time, same place. Barry Anderson will be back in this chair. We invite you to join us next week. Phone in your questions ahead of time if you'd like, or join us live on your legislators. Thank you for viewing. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join in the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching your legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. 